And that was a time of a very peculiar time. And to have that connection with a, a guy like uh, Stallone's character, Rocky Balboa, was unusual. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't elegant, it wasn't slick, it wasn't contrived, it wasn't, it wasn't sophisticated. It just felt inevitable from the first line. We shot stuff everywhere in that movie that had never been done before, the stuff in the ring, the stuff in that meat locker. There was no way in the world to make that shot weaving between those sides of beef unless you have, happen to have the old brown stabilizer. Because how else are you going to do that? So I, I had the camera out here, and I was holding these beeves out, and I had my hand was greasy from pushing them out of my own way and trying to sneak through there. I love that stuff. I love to move the camera. I love the three-dimensional look of it. I love the way it tells you things about a set when you move, it tells you the shape of objects. Even though we're looking at a two-dimensional medium, when we start to move, we're actually going through these right eye, left eye positions, and we understand the shape of objects. That, I think, is the thing that pleases me the most, is that we've sort of handed off another instrument in the orchestra. Now we come into the arena, the sports arena in Los Angeles. I was there mainly because I could be certain that the punches would sell. And the idea is if, you, if you're faking a punch, there's really only one good angle to see it. The best angle to see it is just that over the shoulder where you, you have the wide angle effect of the boxer's head snapping back to you, but you can't see the point of contact. Now, of course, the trick is make the punches look like they're real. And the reason I was in the ring, in the sports arena for our few days in the ring, was to try something brand new, which was the camera circling around, looking over the shoulder of one fighter or the other, almost the referee's eye view, if you will, which had never been seen in the ring in this kind of very fluid way of being able to circle with the fighters because they're always circling, circling, circling. You've got to see it either over the shoulder of the guy throwing the punch or over the shoulder of the guy receiving the punch. And both instances, it looks really real. In the case where you're over the shoulder of the receiver, you have to be prepared to jerk back out of the way if you're close because Sly threw his head back with fantastic energy and really good timing. So we shot each round with me in the ring and then we sh cleared me out so the other cameras could work and I just hovered around in the outskirts and pretended to be a dolly because the quarters were too close to have a dolly and in overhead shot you'd see the rail so I was able to be useful down there as well. I did forget to remove my very distinctive striped shirt so of course you can see this odd striped shirt person who looks like he's carrying a sewing machine wandering around maybe standing by in case someone's boxing shorts were ripped I mean who knows what I was doing. It's funny I, I expected of course that everyone on earth would immediately want one and I did not take into account how conservative even a business like the movie business is, uh, uh, by and large. And it was the bold, self-confident people that, uh, that went for it right away, that knew what they wanted and went for it. It was Haskell Wexler and Hal Ashby for Bound for Glory. It was John Avildsen and company for uh, Rocky. And it was the late, great Conrad Hall and Schlesinger from Marathon Man. Those three films signed it up right away. I worked on all three alternately, which was an amazing experience for me. And it was when we started to teach people how to do it and run these study cam workshops and, and democratize it and let other people in on it and sell them all over the place that it became a phenomenon because then everybody's energy, you know, was involved in being able to do this magical thing with a camera. and to persuade other people to do it and so on. And that's really when it took off. It turns out to be not just a tool, but an instrument. It turns out to be an instrument that's capable of being played with great sensitivity, not, not as a show-off kind of thing, but as a, you know, an ensemble instrument in the act of filmmaking, an instrument that puts the lens in the most subtle way where you want it at the moment and does something in terms of coming at you, you know, where it isn't a zoom, it's we're moving through space, but we're not calling attention to it and waving a flag and, you know, shooting off firecrackers. We're, we're closing on you. Let, let me give you a quick tour of the machine, all right? Um, it's, it still works the same way that the prototype worked 30 years ago. Uh, 
we fell into probably the best way to do this little trick, or otherwise somebody would have done it differently. But then and now, it's uh, a gimbal, which is a lovely bit of goods that isolates the camera in the angular sense. Right, Ben? This is Ben. Hi, Ben. An arm that acts like a tireless spring-powered arm that never gets tired. Poor Ben may get tired, other parts of him, but the arm will never get tired. A spread out mass so that it's very inert, you know. It feels like roughly what, the Lusitania in terms of mass, right? It's pretty tough. The Queen Mary too. And then a video monitor so that you can see what you're shooting. Because if you tried to have your eye on the finder while you're walking around, it would never work. So as it turns out, the combination of spread out mass, gimbal, arm, and monitor, those four things uh, were the basis for a patent that lasted its entire life. It was never successfully busted, and it is still the way these things are made all over the world. We love that. What I have continued to do is invent stuff. Uh, it always kind of surprises me, but it usually comes for the same reason, which is somebody needs or wants something, or I want something that doesn't exist. And so I've kept on uh, doing it in the years since Rocky, I, in the early 80s, invented something called the Skycam, which is a stabilized camera on wires that are you know, taken up and let out by computer so it can fly anywhere in a football field. I did a camera called the Moby Cam that chases the swimmers underwater for the Barcelona Olympics. I did the dive cam that the camera falls with the divers in Atlanta. They're all, oddly enough, derived from the original conception of the study cam. There's something about balance in the end that is why the study cam is elegant. It's clear watching somebody do it that the object itself has a poise of some sort. Sly came to the American Society of Cinematographers and handed off an award to me a couple of years ago. And I said to him at the time, that was a fantastic gift for all of us, that movie. Thank you for that. Thanks for that script and thanks for that idea. It was a great experience. That shooting was in nearly 30 years ago. We've all, of course, been through an amazing amount ever since. And uh, I think we're all getting now a remarkably mellow and beginning to really enjoy the after effects of having done that remarkable thing in that remarkable time. Wonderful time in the movie business to, to make that little uh, bit of innovation and that kind of a movie.